Welcome to Thorne's YouTube channel. It's going to be a wild ride. And then after this, if people don't know, when you left Liquid, you went and actually you just went with Hiko basically. If people can't remember, Hiko originally came and replaced Stanislaw in Optic. And the problem with that team was, because Stanislaw was the IGL, this is a team that's now just lost its IGL. And then Hiko's coming and like, it's not really like the right role for him either. And then you were just there for a few months. Why, were you, why was it only a few months? Like, did they actually give you a proper try in this team? It doesn't feel like it. No, right? not at all. Like when I joined that team, the team, I mean, that's the thing, like... I, 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 I am aware of the issues I had with, as a coach back in the days, but there's a lot of these teams that I joined where it's just like, even I joined a dead project, which is, this This is a good example. Like when I joined Optic, the project is already pretty much dead. Like I remember that Mixwell was already negotiating his way out of Optic. Yep. I think he, he wanted to join Liquid or something yep. like that. And when I joined the team, it, it wasn't like this. Hey, Luis, you're joining Optic and the team is dead. And this is what's going to happen. It was more like, hey, Luis, join, join, can, would you like to join Optic? Yeah, sure. One week into the team. And then I find out that this guy is negotiating this. This guy is negotiating that. The team is dead. And I'm just like, well, nice. Like, what am I doing here? And then, like, we even tried a little bit. Like, we brought Hiko, as I said. Like, we, we tried to do things. But me and Hiko, we were more like trying to trying to see if we were able to maybe stay in the, under the opt optic organization to maybe build something afterwards right. or maybe try to get Mixwell and Rush to stay in the team and then build something after uh, afterwards. But yeah, I mean, the project was pretty much that. Like we're, I remember we barely practiced or, or anything like that. I remember people were really way too focused on different stuff. So, I mean, that, that's that's mainly why the, the project didn't, didn't go well and we didn't stay together and the project pretty much died after that. So after this, you came to Misfits, which for me is one of the teams that started to like rehabilitate your reputation and like show something to this team. And obviously this was the team famously in-game led by Sean Gares. So give me some thoughts on Sean Gares. It was easy later. Sean Gares, like I, I had issues with Sean Gares uh, as well. And I think he even spoke about it like in interviews and stuff like that. But I, I got to give credit to the guy. Like in my opinion, Sean Gares is a really good leader. Like he's very good at like telling the players the way they should be playing, explaining his thoughts and stuff like that. He, I got really surprised by uh, his ability to to share his opinions about the game. Again, a guy that is very, very smart about the game. But my biggest issue with Shangaris back in the days was his individual performance. Um, I think back in the days already, we, we could tell that it was really hard for teams to compete if they had an IGL or a player in the team who wasn't able to put up numbers. And that's, even back in the days, I started to realize that it would be extremely hard for us to compete on a, on a top level as long as, unfortunately, Sean wouldn't be able to, you know, uh, improve his numbers. And I think that was the biggest thing. And again, I don't think I did voice it in the best way as possible. I don't think I talked enough with Sean to be able to figure out a way to maybe help me more in an individual way. But I also think that Sean was so focused on the pieces of the team and focused on, on, on like building the team and making sure that he, 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 he make to make sure that all the players feel comfortable, that he didn't have time enough to, you know, focus on himself. I think that's one of the main things that maybe he, he should have done differently. And one of the things that I actually would like to do different if, you know, if we could roll back on time and redo things, would be the would be me talking way more with Chang Garris and try to help him to to you know on an individual level, which I don't think I did a, we, we did it enough. But yeah, I mean, we as you said, like joined the team. We had a couple good, decent results. Like we brought Amanek and Devil Duvek to to the roster. We started doing pretty decent. Um. We also had uh, issues with Shazam at some point. I remember Shaz I don't remember exactly what drama we had, but I remember Shazam had some problems with like his personal life, and then suddenly he's not competing at the major qualifier. I don't know. There was some kind of a drama, which again, like it, it just seems to always happen uh, with my teams, where I'm just put in this situation where, like, this weird spot where I have to, you know, manage this this type of stuff when a team is doing so great and then suddenly something weird happens and then everything collapses. I think that was mainly what happened with the, the Shazam thing that yeah, uh, made us uh, made us underperform quite a lot. 
One player in this team I did want to ask about, actually, is the name you didn't mention, which was the young player, Sick. Because this was oh, a yeah. guy where, if people don't know, the class of people, he was, he was coming through at the same time as, like, Twists, etc. And he was supposed to be, if people don't know, like, one of the next, like, great players. People thought he was going to be, like, a swag to Elise type top player. Like, what, what, what issues did this guy have? To, if people don't know, he still plays Varit to this day, as far as I know. Like, he, ne- he just never reached that top, top level. So, what, like, what, what would you say about this player? I think I would compare him a little bit with Phelps as well. I think, you know, they're just very introspective, like very calm. He's very calm and very chill, easy to to go with, but just very introspective. Like, and I think that's probably, that was probably his biggest challenge in CS. Because uh, I, I don't think that he was, at least when I coached him, I don't think he was a guy voicing his opinion of like the things he liked, the, the, the way he wanted to play and stuff like that. So, you know, we were just basically using him the, the way we wanted. We didn't know if he was actually comfortable or not because, you know, you would, you would always just go to the guy and be like, hey, uh, do you want to do this? And he's always like, yeah, sure, I'm going to do it. Yeah, sure. Like, it was never, there was never a conversation. It was always like, yeah, sure. Like, he was always doing things just for the sake of doing things. Um, he was playing good. I also think that he, he did show a lot of uh, talent, like a lot of uh, uh, good individual performances back in the days, mechanics and stuff. But I don't know. I think just one of those players that, are not uh, good on like voicing their opinions to be able to you know uh, maybe get things to the to the way they want um, yeah maybe get even opportunities and and stuff like that. Right, after this is where I actually do think, like, one of the teams that makes people think, like, Peacemakers a meme was this Tai Lu project. Was, like, first oh, of yeah. all, how the fuck do you end up with Tai Lu in China, mate? Like, was there no other offers available? And then secondly, this was not that many months, obviously, right? Wasn't this the one also where it had that, like, weird drama associated where, like, because you'd, like, qualified to the major, but you did left the team, like, they were, like, not going to give you any of the sticker money? So wasn't it some weird shit like that? Give me your thoughts on this. How did this Tai Lu move come about? Yeah, the Tyler move came about. Uh, I think I was I was already I already left Misfits, and when I had this opportunity to coach Tyler, I, I remember that I did stay a little bit of like I tried to search for other organizations, other teams and stuff, and I I was struggling, right? As you said, like you know, I started to go downhill in my career, go from Liquid to Mis to Optic, and then Misfits, and then things start falling apart, and then I started to get a little bit worried about like what what's next, right? And then when Tyler approached me. I found it as an opportunity to maybe, you know, get a get a good feeling of a different culture, see how things goes. It was a pretty decent offer back in the days as well. So it was just like, you know what, like let's just give it a try, see how it goes. Um, I would also have a guy full time with me translating and everything else. Um, but I didn't, I didn't, I definitely didn't know how much of a challenge that would be, for sure. Like it was insane. Um, and I'm going to touch on the, the major thing uh, really soon. But the, the biggest thing about Tyler was definitely the language barrier. Like, it was impossible to work with. Like, I, I didn't know that the Chinese players, most of them wouldn't even understand English. They right? speak almost not as fast at all, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, nothing. Like, it was it was mainly me and B and Ted talking English. And even Hansel, like, B and Ted, like, it's not like he's fluent and he understands everything. Like, he, he also did struggle a little bit towards the beginning. Um so everything had to be translated. And I think, to be honest, like, if there was one thing that I learned with Tylo and that was good for me, was, like, the amount of respect they have for each other as teammates and the amount of respect they had for me as a coach as well. You know, obviously, you would kind of expect that, like, you know, a guy with experience, Coach Liquid, like, yeah, sure. But it was just something else, you know. Even though they had their issues with understanding the way I wanted to call, the way I wanted to do things, but there were never a single moment that I could say, like, that I could tell any of them was ever tilted or about because they didn't understood anything or because they didn't the language barrier or anything. They're always pushing themselves really hard and always trying to, to learn with me. So I think they have a, you know, just in general, at least in that team, they had a beautiful way of, like, treating each other and stuff like that, you know. Um, that gave me inspiration to try to actually help those guys. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the major thing that you asked, it was mainly, from what I remember, right? Um, I left Silu to join Heroic. <clears throat> and then after some period, I think one of the players had each, I think it was B and Ted had a visa issue or something like that. He couldn't compete at the major. 
and then they asked me to compete because I was uh, because I did the qualifier with them, so I was the only one able to play. Uh, and then I spoke with Heroic back in the days, and I basically told them like, hey, this is the situation. Uh, Heroic uh, Tyloo wants me to play the major for them. We have a decent amount of tournaments to play, qualify, and stuff like that. And I think this would hurt us for sure. But if you guys allow me to do it, then of course I'm, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to hurt the Tylu guys. I want to try to to do it. Um, but it was hard because, like, I, I voiced my opinion to the to the heroic organization that I don't think it was optimal because I just joined the team and I didn't want them to be without me in a lot of important qualifiers and stuff like that. And the organization backed me up and said, like, Louis, it's your call and stuff like that. So I had a, a few talks with the Tai Lu, made sure they understood, like, this is the situation. If I play with you guys, it's going to hurt my team. It's going to be pretty bad and stuff like that. So I did voice my opinion about that. And then it did feel like they felt, they, they I don't know exactly the word, but like they, they didn't feel appreciated enough about it. Just they sort of, of got like offended by it or something, right? They almost yeah, felt like offended, the fact you, offended. Asked, you asked for like money or something, but they almost seemed like they were offended or something, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then what happened was mainly like, hey, um, then I started negotiation to my, my way to, to, to be able to play with them. And then basically what I asked was like, well, Vietnam is going to get sticker money uh, and stuff like that. Basically, all I want is you guys would have to pay my salary for Heroic. Like, Heroic wouldn't have to pay my salary since I'm playing with you guys, so you guys would have to pay uh, the salary. And if BNT is getting sticker money, like, maybe we could split it and m make it fair for everybody because if, I'm, if I end up playing, then I want to have a sticker money as well. Like, uh, you know, it's a good opportunity for me to, to have my own sticker or something like sure. that. And just the fact that I was asking them for money and asking them about this, plus the fact that I originally I said no, then... After that, I came back and said, yeah, I can do that. And then I uh, started negotiating the thing. I think they felt offended. Uh, nice. they, they, they felt that I was only doing this for the money. Yes. And then that's where they basically decided to pull the plug and say like, yeah, well, we're not playing the major anymore. And kind of blame it on me kind of thing. And I think it's just, to be honest, I think it's just a thing about like the Chinese culture or Asian culture where, you know, I don't blame them. It's just a thing that, that they... They they yes. felt I was only doing this for the money. Maybe I didn't communicate well enough. Uh, but yeah, once they made up their minds about that they didn't want to play the major, I even told them. I even tried to approach them and be like, okay, you know what? Whatever. Like I don't want to hurt you guys. I don't want you guys to miss a major. Just whatever. Don't give me any money. Don't give me any sticker. Like let's just do it. I don't want you guys to go this way. But again, it didn't work. Like they, they didn't, they didn't fall back in their decision. They're just like, well, now you want to do this? Like whatever. Like we don't want to play the major anymore with you. So yeah, and that's what happened. <laughs> right. When you came to this heroic squad, this is like a very, very different team than anything that the current heroic is. If someone's a modern day fan, this was the one where basically it was the one that. Pr I mean, this is before your time, but it's the one that originally started with like Valde and Glaive, et cetera, but they'd gone already at this point in time. So it was the one with Snappy. Yogi was still there, obviously, from the back of the day. Nico, the one with the small K, the one that was always MSL's mate. He was in this team as well. Modi was still there, obviously, the Swedish player. Like, th this was like a pretty interesting bunch of players. Like, there's not, Snappy's the IGL. Like, th like, these are like good names on paper. So what, what do you think about this particular era of the squad? Like, what, what worked, what didn't? I think that, yeah, as I said it very well, um, I think it was a really good roster, especially like when, when I joined the roster, uh, we had a lot of, a, a very good structure behind it with the with the organization and everything. So we pretty much only had to focus on the in-game stuff. Uh, Snappy was a really good IGL uh, who, who knew how to manage the pieces and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think, again, like one of the biggest challenges we had in that team was mainly like personalities. Uh, and also, uh, I think Yugi back in the days, really short after I joined, he started having like personal problems, like family issues or something like that, which got him to, you know, uh, be out of the team for a month or so or something like that. And then I think the biggest challenge we had in that team was was not like problems inside the team, was more like the amount of issues we had with outside of the team stuff. But uh, I also remember that when I joined that team, uh, Again, just like uh, in some of the other teams I joined, I remember that I think 
people were not necessarily happy with EC tags performance. Um, and when I joined, after gaining all these experience from my from my previous teams, I remember that people were already questioning EC tag and trying to get rid of him from the team. And I was like, guys, come on! I just joined the team. Please let me do my job. Let me actually try to help the guy to to develop as a player before we make any decisions. Because otherwise, like I just joined this, and the guys start doing roster changes. And then, like, th that's not the way it should be done. And I think they did give me a lot of respect and power within that roster to be able to, you know, be a part of those decisions. And that's... And I always say it like this, like, uh, there was this period of my career where I had a lot of uh, power at the beginning, calling and everything like that. And then suddenly I found myself in a weird position where I was struggling to adapt to the new coaching rule. And then there's this period of my career in Heroic specifically where I did know how to manage my power as a coach and how to uh, the way I should be coaching that team. And I think they gave me a lot of trust and respect, and that helped me a lot. And, uh, and that's the main reason why I joined that roster, and then I left because of health issues and stuff like that, and then they asked me to come back again, probably because, you know, I, I, I did a good job with the, with the, with the team. Right, this is where I, I'm, I'm trying to structure this, where I want to ask another question about like a, a meme about your reputation, which is you said it earlier, but it was accurate. The perception of Peacemaker is this, right? He gets into the team, so it means he did a good job like selling himself, like I'd be a good coach or I'd fit or whatever. He joins the team, but then the perception is, because he'd been with so many different IGLs and players and so many different orgs, like it, it just, it, it, early on, there's some sort of like a point where it's like a fork in the road and it's like, right, Peacemaker wants it done this way and either the team agrees, in which case like maybe like a player gets kicked out or the team disagrees and Peacemaker gets kicked out. That was the perception. And in this squad, especially because you joined the team and as you say, it was just like roster move, roster move, roster move. And then you were out the team. It makes it look like the same thing. Like what the fuck? I so what would you say to that angle? Like, like you said earlier, there's a little bit of truth to it. Like, how would you explain that aspect of, because on the one hand, I think people painted it at the time as like, you were being too stubborn or too selfish. But at the same time, mate, I'm actually from a different perspective. I think as a coach, like, it's a bit, I, I'll give you the best example ever. In my opinion, the best example ever was when Kassad was briefly in Cloud9. You remember that? A lot of people don't when he was in the Henry G Cloud9. Because what a lot of people forget is he quit very quickly afterwards. Like they barely had played any tournaments. And the reason he left was him and the IGL didn't have the same vision for the game. And so he sort of realized, like, what's the point in me putting my name as, like, coach if it's not me doing my system and I'm going to get blamed or credited either way? Like, I'm as well going to join a team where I can do, like, Kassad Counter-Strike, basically. So I always thought, like, I agree with that philosophy. Like, if you the coach you should have a you should have a say you should be able to put your stamp on i mean as i just alluded to there people are going to judge you if you fail in the team whether it was you who made the call or not so what's your take on this angle it sounds like it's been another challenge you've had over your career yes for sure and i think that uh even up until today i still think that way you know i think i, I agree with the cassad angle especially because like if i if i am the coach and I need to have the trust from the organization and the players in order to do my job. If I don't have that, it is really challenging. Like, and it, I'm not talking about, you know, like the way the team plays completely. Like, I don't want the team to play completely my way and stuff like that. I think that was, I was able to do that back in the days because I was IGLing. But as a coach, I don't think you should run a system like that anymore. I don't think it works like that. I think you do need an IGL and you need, you know, you need to give him space and that's, Probably one of the reasons why me and Snappy get along really well um, was mainly because of this. Mainly because like I was able to respect and understand the ways that he wanted to call and the way he saw the game and stuff. Uh, but yeah, it was it was always always very challenging for me throughout my career to 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 understand uh, the things you said. And sometimes during my career as well, I just gave up on my own beliefs and the own things I believe in. Uh, my own thoughts and everything just for the sake of being on a team and sometimes I was just doing my stuff like stuff that I didn't necessarily agree with and then at, later on I would just you know I was just boiling up and then I just exploded and voiced my opinion and then everything fell apart or it was me having way too much control and doing everything my way and not being able to fully understand the other side of the story and the players and the way they wanted to do things and stuff like that it was always like um, as you said very well like a mixture of like you know me boiling up and not doing things my way and then eventually just explode or me doing everything my way and the players not being happy, basically, yeah. 
right? When you came back to this squad, this was when it was a really different version of Heroic. Because I remember one of the key moves you made was, obviously, Snappy had gone ages ago to Optic. This was when Blame F came in and he even came in. Wasn't he even in this team, the IGL? Like, even though at the time, it, like, he was just a player before that, right? What was the take on that? What, how did it come along with Blame F? Now, Blame F was one of the players that we were scouting before we actually picked him up. I remember that he didn't got brought into the team to be the IGL or anything like that. It was mainly because of his performance. Like, he was pretty consistent back in the days and putting up good numbers in his teams. And it was just mainly role-wise what we, what we thought that would be good for us. Um, and then, again, when, when he joined the team, we found ourselves in the situation where we need an IGL, like because people didn't want to really want a Cillian to be the. I think a Cillian was in the roster back in the days, yes. right? If I'm not mistaken, yeah. So people didn't w really want a Cillian to be the IGL, and then we found ourselves in a situation where basically we need to figure out who's gonna be IGLing. And then I remember we tried with Freiberg a little bit towards the beginning, and then Freiberg didn't feel comfortable doing that. Uh, and then yeah, blame F as a, I guess strong personality and stood up guy as he is he was just like you know guys like i i did it for a short period of time with the uh, epsilon and i could give it a try and stuff like that and then that's where everything started like i think blame f does have a very good um, a good like a very good understanding of the game and but he like he he knows how to I think his, his style of IGL, like he was very authoritative, like, you know, I want things to be done this way, uh, blah, blah, blah. And I think that's actually something we needed back in the days. This, uh, a lot of, like, a lot of structure, which we didn't have with Asylian, at least. We felt way more comfortable under Blame F than we did with Asylian. And I think that helped a lot, yeah. Even in this time period, like he wasn't maybe at the level he is now with Astralis, but even back then you could see Blame F was like a really impressive individual player, right? No, oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, the thing about Blame F again, uh, just puts a lot of dedication into the game. Uh, watches a lot of, like, I, I don't think I ever met a player that watched as many demos as Blame F does. Like, you know, he's super dedicated, tries to understand everything, uh, was asking me a lot of questions, like talking about CS a lot. And I think, again, one of the reasons why we get along very well was because we're actually studying the game a lot together and figuring out stuff uh, about the way we wanted to play and stuff. Um, and I think Blame F, you know, people used to call him a, he still does call him a baiter and stuff like sure. that in the game. And I think he, he, I, I don't think he's doing that on purpose, to be honest. Like, I, I really don't think so. I think it's just the way he likes to play. And he is a player that, you know, if you try to put Blame F out of his comfortable zone, you're not going to get the best out of him. And the best out of him is playing the way he does and the way he wants to play. And if you're going to have a Blame F type of guy on the team, uh, with the amount of potential he has, you want to put him out of his comfortable zone. I don't think it makes much sense. And I think we saw that a little bit with Astralis now towards the, the beginning of the roster. I don't think Blame F was playing in his comfortable zone at all. Uh, I don't know if he was happy with the roles he had and stuff. I don't think so. Uh, he was basically, you know, joins Astralis, national team. I think he was just more like, you know, I, I, this is a dream coming true for me, sure. so I just want to do whatever. But I don't think that's necessarily a, a role that suits him. Uh, now I think he's... But, it, but it's hard because the, the way Blame F likes to play, he does require a lot of space and a lot of good roles in the in his teams. For example, in our team, he basically had a lot of, like, the best roles, I guess we can put it like that, on the map. So, like, you know, uh, Omirage would play Connector, on Overpass would play A, A, C, T, and... Uh, the guy with a lot of freedom to go for kills and space and stuff like that. So to be fair, he does have a lot of good roles in order to have that impact he has. Uh, but you know, he he proved himself, I think, and that's the way he likes to play. If you want to have Blame F in your team, you should already know that that's the roles he wants. That's the roles he like. He he enjoys playing. And if you don't have that uh, that spot open in the team, you better not bring him to the team. Does that make sense? 
One thing I also want to ask, because it seems like it's something that's maybe been a, a theme of your career as well, is I'll relate it to my own career. I often tell people this story, that one of the reasons I think it's so whack when people try to come at me on the angle of like, oh, you call yourself the historian, like, oh, you think you know all about this. It's like, mate, the joke now is like, do you know how many decades, literally over a decade, I used to be the person who was just considered a nerd in a culture of nerds. Like, you'd think we're all nerds because we're playing video games, right? But this is what people don't get, Peacemaker. Especially back in the day before there was loads of money. Like now, if you say now, like if you're someone like Cadian now, who obviously like puts in loads of effort and cares a lot, now you'll be praised for it because it's got all the status symbols. You get money, you're famous, like you are a pro, it's a dream job. So now people understand that. But back in the day, Peacemaker, like loads of people, loads of pros, and loads of people in esports, because it wasn't cool, they like, it, it was actually considered like the cool thing to do back then was to pretend you didn't care that much. Or like, I like try, but I'm not like a nerd. You know, I don't like, it's not my whole life, bro. I don't just like live CS or whatever. Like, but actually people like me, you blame F, but we do live CS. Like we are the guys putting the million hours in. So the funny thing is, I actually think Peacemaker, people think early on in your career that the problem you had was you were a fake coach and that you're just like doing nothing. And your, your actual problem seems like the opposite. It's like you're trying to just live the game and go to the top. And you, what you're finding is because of the era of time we're talking about, a lot of pros weren't that serious back then. There's not a lot of them were putting in extra hours and definitely not a lot of them care about things like scouting the opponent or like deep conversations about how the game works. They just want to kind of like play and shoot people in the, uh, people in the head. They are their kids, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's still up until today. Like you still see a lot of players like who is not the, uh, nowadays I understand a little bit better like this, uh, you know, different personalities, different ways of seeing things. Uh, but for me at the beginning, it was very challenging. I think mainly because I wanted this so much. I wanted to, to reach the top and be a successful coach and have, be a successful team. There was really challenging for me to see like me putting a lot of hours and dedicating myself so much to this, to see the guy right next to me, like not caring at all or just being like, well, oh, whatever, or putting a little bit of like extra in term, instead of like the amount he actually needed to put. Uh, it was very challenging for me at the beginning. And as you, as you uh, mentioned perfectly, some of some players like they really don't care. Like they feel like they're talented enough that they really don't feel the need to put up extra hours. Or I think the biggest challenge for me was when I saw IGL is doing that because I never, I could never understand IGLs who were lazy or not putting up uh, extra time into the game. Because mainly the way I see IGLs and we, we spoke about it a lot already. You know, you have to be an example in the team. And if you are a lazy IGL who's not going to be there first during the day and working, people need to see that you pull up hours and stuff. And that's the thing that BlameF does really well. You know, BlameF is always the first guy coming in, working a lot, showing the people around him that he really wants this. And that does inspire everyone else to be working harder. And a lot of IGLs, they're simply not that way. Um, they... I don't know exactly why, if they if they don't enjoy the game as much as they should, if it's just because it gets to a point where maybe it affects them in a negative way. But I at least hardly believe that a guy like Kerrigan, a guy like Glaive, I haven't coached them, but I have hardly believe that they're lazy and they're not putting a lot of hours into the game. So, you know, a guy like Fallen, for example, I before I coached him, I was always questioning because there was always this meme about falling, like not preparing for the opponent, not working. Uh, Having all the know, business I, stuff I and that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, all the business stuff and stuff like that. So I always questioned myself, like, is falling really dedicated or is he just pretending to be dedicated on stream for his yes. fans and stuff like that? And yeah, I was surprised. Again, a guy that's very dedicated is always watching stuff, like to a point where I'm mean, even like, bro, come on, like, let me do my job because you're doing my job and your job at the same time. And that's kind of like the, the feeling I have that an IGL needs to be. Like, the IGL needs to be a guy super involved in the team. And it just gets... I, I just, it's just mind-blowing for me when I see specifically IGLs not putting up the work they should. Yeah. One player from this heroic team I wanted to ask about was, obviously now it's super relevant because he's, he's an amazing player now, is Stown, the player who plays in the current heroic. Because when you got him, he was like a really young player. He was like a 17-year-old kid at the time or whatever. I'm sure he wasn't this exact same player he is now at the time, but who was he when you got him in 2019? 
when we got him, like again, he was uh, he was playing really well individually. I, f I think he was playing fragsters. I really showed a lot of potential. Um, the things we heard about him back in the days was that he was a guy that uh, was voicing his opinion, which was actually surprising for me for a young guy to be voicing his opinion and very you know like not an introspective kind of type of guy which I used to coach a lot, players like that, especially when they're young, they're super shy and not voicing their opinions and stuff. That wasn't the case with Stown. I had conversations with him before we signed him, and I could tell that the guy was um, was very good. Like, you know, very, very... I had very good conversations with him. I think his understanding about CS and the way he, he wanted to play was very aligned with me and BlameF. Um, but I remember, like, when even when we signed him, like, uh, I remember the first couple of days in the office like I, I don't think the guy literally didn't care like he, he wanted so much to be a part of that team that he didn't really care about his contract and stuff like at some point his family just signing the contract in the office like while he's competing he's playing i don't even think he saw the contract like he's just like well my parents you go deal with it like sign for me whatever i'm just happy to be here and i'm just i just want to play and like i i i don't i'm not even sure that he signed a good contract with heroic his first contract i'm not sure he signed a good one uh but from for him it really didn't matter like he just wanted that opportunity so much and he wanted to be a part of the team so much and yeah i mean just in general i think he's a he's a type of player that when when we started working with him he surprised all of us a lot because of mainly the amount of like potential he had the amount of firepower he has and mainly because of the fact that he was you know controlling the pieces around him, controlling the stuff we're doing in the game way more than we actually expected. And we actually needed a guy like that in the team because, you know, Blame F was controlling a lot and calling a lot and all that kind of stuff. But we did miss a second voice in the team, a guy who would be like, you know, kind of like a secondary caller type of uh, kind of thing. And I think Stone was that guy instantly from the beginning. Like he was just very good at voicing his opinions about the th the stuff he liked to do. Very good at like taking initiative on the map. And you could still like you could still tell in heroic. And I even asked him in a, one of the interview that I did in a segment with him uh, during the major. And I don't think people understand the amount of impact he has in that team. Like yes, Kaden gets all the credit for being a good IGL and all that kind of stuff. But I think Stone helps a lot, a lot. Right. One of the things that was weird was after this, you had the time where you went to Mad Lions, right? Which if people remember was originally that like trick squad that came over with Hunden and a bunch of other players that we'll talk about in a minute, obviously, right? When you said earlier about the Sean Gares example, this has to be the most ridiculous one of all time. Like Hunden is the most perfect example of a player where like, look, his mind for the game and the things he's done are brilliant. But like you, at the end of the day, like you have to be able to do something inside the server of Counter-Strike. And at, at the level that that team was at, like it's at tier one now, he just could not have played and being a good player like it doesn't matter how good the call is right if one player frags that badly like you'd have to call like three times better than anyone else or something crazy right yeah i think that the, the biggest thing with mad lions was when when i joined the team they were starting to be relevant as a team so they're playing pretty good against the uh, tire two opposition then they're about to play some important qualifiers then again i joined the team we started working really well we started qualifying for events and then once we played in Katowice, I think, and we started competing against Tire 1 opposition more often. I think pretty much the whole team, to be quite transparent, like pretty much the whole team came to me and said, like, Lewis, if we want to be competitive and want to play against these guys, it is really hard to compete with a guy putting up these numbers. And yeah, how the numbers were terrifying. Like it was, it, it was really hard for me to find a, an argument against that also because I believe that and I experienced that with Chang Harris. And... You know, I think Hunter was a really... I, I, I think one, one thing is for sure, as you said. Hunter was really good, really smart, knew how, how to control the pieces, build teams and stuff. I think he's amazing at that. But nowadays, I I just don't think... like As you, as you said, and I just don't think like you can afford to have an IGL who's unable to put up numbers. Like The game became like... You, you know, obviously the strategic part is so important, but if you're not able to shoot heads and, and stuff like that, it doesn't matter. Like, it literally doesn't matter. So I think when the team came to me and approached me that way, and I could tell that everybody was, you know, uh, pretty much aligned about it. Nobody from the team was, like, hesitating about it. Um, for me, it was pretty easy to to decide that, yeah, we, we need to go a different road. 
uh, also because like you know when again it's one of those things when you start playing against better opposition and then the honeymoon period kind of finishes and they start having issues and, and stuff like that then the numbers does matter but also the way that Honden was calling sometimes also bother people some people wanted to play in a different way Bobski for example I think Bobski is a good example like Bobski is a guy that again very strong personality guy that knows really well about CS I would actually compare Bobski with Elish like pretty much the same personality like two really smart guys who understand a lot about the game it's actually a Massive shame for me that Bobski, uh, you know, stopped competing. Like, I think the guy should be in any of these rosters nowadays, heroic, astralis, like, it doesn't matter. Like, he should be in those rosters. Massive shame because I think the guy is underrated, like, super smart, you know, not as dedicated as Elish, but he just really talented. And Bobski was one of the players that was not happy about the way Honden wanted to call on certain maps and stuff like that. So, for me, it was just natural a natural decision to just go a different, uh, go with a different route after Caravisa. Yeah? Right? Did it actually? I know the tournament was online and all that jazz and flashpoint, but like, was there must have been significance for you personally to beat MIBR in the final? Right? That's a pretty big win. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it was it was probably like uh, one of the most important wins of my career, mainly because of like you know. Um, I think a lot of people in first first of all like I was unproven as a coach for the Brazilian scene like I don't think people gave me enough credit and even the the Brazilian guys from uh, from LBR, like I don't think they 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 respected me as much as they did after uh, I was able to beat them that's for sure um yeah I mean I just remember us again in that specific iteration of the roster when we were in an A during COVID and all the situations going on, like we we're living together. And when we brought a scene into the team, we knew that like, you know, it's not a massive improvement to the team, but it would be a guy that was willing to do and play the way we wanted to play. So when we brought into the team and then we started working and stuff like that, we did have a little bit of issues and stuff, but everybody was super aligned and we, everybody understood that if we were, if, if, we would basically like this was a good opportunity for us to win a relevant tournament, uh, earn a lot of money with the prize pool <laughs> in Flashpoint, sure. and and also like, you know, there wasn't like a lot of top teams competing in that event back in the days, but there was enough teams for us to you know feel motivated to put up the hours and stuff, and mainly because since we just did a roster change and we're all living together, we just basically decided to just you know grind the game as much as we could, so we're yeah. Play, putting up a lot of hours and yeah we just had a really good atmosphere you know i think it was it was nice because we had this kind of like a honeymoon period uh because we just made a roster change and everything's clicking and yeah but uh, yeah the the win against mrbr was very special for me but i remember that that was a crazy match right <laughs> like, i like i can't describe like the amount of nerves and what i felt during that game especially as a coach it was a really big test for me because you know, uh, not being able to call anymore and not be able to control things anymore. And, you know, people calling in Danish back in the days and I don't right, fully yeah. understand what they talked about. And then suddenly I see myself like losing the tournament in the final and then we start grinding ourselves back into the game. Oh, well, and the way, and just the way it happened with the ninja diffuses and all those clutch situations, it was crazy. Like, I think it was just, it just had to happen. But yeah, it was just a very special moment for, for all of us. By the way, along those lines, something you touched on there, something I did want to ask you about, which is there has been this weird, even though like, it's funny now because of all the major, you'd get the perception that Brazilian people just all like universally, like they're all super united, they all only spot Brazilian. I always got the vibe, like the Brazilian team was kind of a bit shitty to you back in the day right, when you were coaching all these foreign teams. Didn't they also kind of treat you a little bit like you were a meme or just like you, you weren't taken seriously, right? Like, I mean, like, as you said there, you were never like considered for the job of like being in SK or it might be R or the, the, at the time it was only you and Zeus out there coaching like this it should have been something that should at least have been like on someone's radar right yeah I think to be fair as well like since I I think I only coach Games Academy right and a lot of the people for some reason either they didn't watch CS competitively back in the days or they just forgot completely about what we were able to do in Games Academy and stuff 
because like after a while, after I coach Liquid and then Misfits and then you know all these teams, Heroic and stuff, I don't think people really gave me enough credit to be honest. Like as a Brazilian coach outside of Brazil, coaching different teams and stuff, like I was barely me being mentioned but in the brazilian scene if some people didn't even know i existed even up until today like after i coached uh, when i was coaching imperial right a lot of people came to me and said hey uh, we didn't even know you existed like uh, where uh, were you okay. coaching team liquid back in the 2016 i was like yeah, yeah yeah i actually coached them oh okay nice nice i actually watched that major didn't know you were the coach <laughs> so like it was kind of weird for me um to still live that in imperial like a lot of people actually didn't know about me and the thing about uh, MIBR, I think it was mainly because of my reputation, you know, like uh, because of the, some of the mistakes I did in the past. To be fair, like made people scared of like bringing me into those projects. And basically, like the the meme uh, was all about like Peacemaker joins the team and ruins the project. But in my eyes, right. at least, it was <laughs> it was never like the case. Like I actually joined a lot of teams and they actually made progress. And then at some point, roster chase happens, a lot of stuff happens, and the team collapses and stuff. Some of the times, yes, my fault. Another times, not my fault at all. Optic, for example, and a lot of other other uh, things. Well, I was getting all the blame when I was actually wasn't the reason why those roster moves was happening. But you know, as a coach, it's not like I'm gonna go out and voice my opinion and and share inside the stuff about the team. Like that's not the way it should be done. So I was getting a lot of criticism, and at the end of the day. That's what those players see, and that's what the MIBR organization or, you know, those guys, they, they hear uh, a lot of, like, bad stuff about me. And obviously, like, why would we risk getting rid of Zeus to bring in a guy who doesn't necessarily have a really good reputation? Maybe he's going to come and try to change everything, and then we're going to collapse as a team. Like, why, we, why would we even bother doing a change like that? So I understand them, yeah. Right. In this Mad Lions team, one player I did want to ask about, because again, he's mega relevant now in light of what's just happened. But back at the days, everyone was looking at the names you mentioned earlier. It's like Bobski, obviously, his playing style is really crazy. You can see his skill. Acor at the time was like lighting the world up. Everyone thought he was going to be... The player that was mad underrated was Shush, obviously, in this team. Like, I think you see this now. Like, the joke, I think, by the way, is like, to me, this is the player I always bring up on by the numbers, where I think the Astralis organization just doesn't seem like they're as committed to being the top team. They're not trying to get the best players like how they let a player like this go I don't know mate because this to me this would be the logical play you'd do like a replacement of Zipnakes or something like that with like just seems like a really good piece to sort of build your team around like who, who is this guy when you coached him um I mean to to even back up your your, your point about Shush I would even go further with Stown like I think you know for me it's it is crazy that Astralis missed on both Stown and Shush as an organization they haven't brought yes. those players to the to them and what what is even crazier to me is that like well, i remember when i was in the office at in copenhagen and i remember you know casper Witt, the astralis uh, director he came to me and he was actually the one who told me about stown i remember him telling me hey luis can you take a look on this guy's town like i look at his stats and stuff and i was like yeah sure where is he from oh he's from denmark and stuff he was actually the guy who introduced me to Stown and to, uh, that made me go and download demos and take a look on him as a player. And then for Australia to miss an opportunity on him and stuff like that, it, it, it is a bit crazy. Same goes for Shush. Like, Shush, when I joined the team, I remember talking to Hunden about, about him. And I remember watching a little bit of uh, some demos from them playing in the, back in the days in Tricked. And Shush was just... A very good anchor player. I remember he was playing all the other positions, all the bad roles in the team, and he was playing pretty decent. Um, Shush is just one of those players that, like, it's just super easy to adapt him into the team. He's uh, he he really like okay. To be fair, there was a point in Mad Lions where he actually wanted to shine more, you know, because he felt like he was being used in a role where he could shine even more if he was playing like star roles and stuff like that. But I remember having this conversation with him where I was like, you know, like you're so good at your roles. Like, sure, I can maybe pick, I can maybe put you in those other roles, but then who the hell is going to do your roles yes. as good as you do, you know? Yeah. And then he was like, yeah, that's true, Louis. Like, I'm just like, yeah, so unfortunately, I don't have the right piece to replace your role right now. So you have to stick to your roles. And honestly, like, it's not about like you shining and being a star player, because I think you are one of the best players 
in the world, you could be one of the best players in the world if you just stick to it. Like, why why would you bother changing? Like, that's not what you need right now. So, and I think he did take that advice because he, st- he, he kept playing those roles up until today. And yeah, he's just underrated. Like, I knew, like, I, I know this might sound cliche, that, oh, this guy knew about uh, him uh, since he coached him and stuff, but being quite honest, like, when I coached him and I saw him playing, how calm he is, collective, how easy he is to, to play with, a guy that, like, honestly, like, doesn't create any issues in the team, just does whatever you need, you ask him to. Again, dedicated, like, just just a role model for for, for the team. And when he joined uh, when he joined Heroic, I wasn't surprised uh, that he would have the success he's having right now. And I think people, as you said, like, people talk a lot about KD and Lance Town, but yeah, Shush is just mega underrated. underrated. Like, the, he doesn't get, a, doesn't get enough credit uh, as he should, but mainly because of his roles. You know, he's not going to have the same numbers as Town and Kadian will have. Uh, that's natural. After this Mad Lions period where it started good and then by the end it was like a bit whatever, after this time period when you then came and you were in the Imperial squad before Fall and the rest of it, it was just Fur and ZQK in 2021, did you actually worry at this point in time, like, my career might be over, maybe I never get a top coaching gig again? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, you know, this has always been a thing for me throughout my career that I, I'm always like, you know, something happens in, in, in the projects I am, I'm, for example, the Mad Lions project, right? Pretty crazy. Like, we're doing great, we win Flashpoint, and then suddenly the team just collapses completely, right? Like, Bobski has a has been approached by Astralis, obviously wants to join Astralis. I don't blame him at all. Uh, had an opportunity to join Astralis, goes to Astralis, and then the organization just basically pulls the plug and, you know, does a lot of, like, weird roster moves. And, you know, like, the thing with Mad Lions was... The thing with Mad Lions was, was, has been a little bit different than Heroic. During the Heroic period, for example, had a lot of backup from the organization and from the management and from the team. And the thing about the heroic, the, the Mad Lions organization was kind of the opposite. Like I had a very good chemistry with the players, but I never felt like I had backup from the organization. Like the, the organization itself, I think like it was always challenging for me to, to understand the way they wanted to approach things. Like we wanted to be a top team. I wanted to go to a direction and the organization wanted to go in a different direction, uh, completely different. And then suddenly they have a great team in their hands and then, everything collapses. So, you know, I always found myself in these weird situations in my career where I'm either really aligned with the players or really aligned with the organization, but not with the players. And then it was very rare moments throughout my career where I'm aligned with actually both and we're all on the same page. Heroic as an example. Uh, And then things are clicking and things are working well. Um, But yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, after, after the Mad Lions gig, I was definitely worried about, you know, what, what, what's next, like what I'm going to do next. And then, you know, the fact that I did, I think that's the thing that people actually don't see is that there is a reason why I coached the first iteration of Heroic and then later on I got back, back into Heroic. And there's also a reason why I coached Blame F and then there is a reason why he brought me to complexity, you know. And I'm, I'm not trying to brag about it or anything. It's just because some people actually don't see this side of the story where it's like, yes, the teams might collapse and I might leave the teams and I might stay six months, one year and stuff. But there's this angle that I would like people to see that, you know, maybe it's not necessarily my fault completely. And there has to be a reason why I'm, I keep playing. I, I keep coaching Easy Tag. I keep coaching Shuj. I keep coaching Blame F. It's actually because, like, we get along really well, you know, like, and we used to do a good job together. And, you know, <clears throat> after Complexity was struggling a little bit and I had this opportunity to to talk a little bit with Blame F, like, it was a no-brainer for us to try to work together again, yeah. Money doesn't grow on trees. And believe it or not, just watching a video for free with the odd ad doesn't really pay the bills. So thanks to the following people for kindly supporting my work and this particular content. And those people are, of course, Ahmed Hedju, Matt Pugnaccio Rakula, Animosity, Butt Pounder 420, Jensen Gore, Kovacevic, Tobias Bernasconi, Tosh, Tukan, and a special thanks always goes out to Jerky's Minion, my main man. 
You know what? There are plenty of perks to be found on my Patreon. Like, you can find out who upcoming guests are for my reflections interviews and talk shows. You can ask me a question in my monthly AMA. Might get roasted if it's a bit spicy in how you phrase it. You can figure out which pieces of content I might want to do next. I often ask people which they think between certain ideas, offer suggestions. You can even take part in one of those long discussions with me about all kinds of esports, whatever's on your mind. So if any of those sound like something that takes your fancy, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Scaluminati today via the Patreon link in the description below.